The Cougs will be bowling this year after securing their sixth win of the season in Pullman against the University of Hawaii. They beat Hawaii 42 to 10. Their next matchup coming this weekend in San Diego against San Diego State, which will be a preview of another future Pac-12 matchup. In this episode, we recap the matchup versus Hawaii, the preview against San Diego State. We answer some viewer questions that were submitted over Instagram, and we also highlight a few former Cug athletes that are currently playing professionally across the NFL, MLB, and NBA. Make sure to comment below any thoughts, questions, comments on this week's matchup, or if there's a topic that you'd like us to cover on next week's episode. Make sure to like and subscribe to the Couch GM for more content like this, and let's get into it. But before we do, the sponsor of this podcast is Black Label Supplements. They are a third-party tested, athlete-approved supplement company based here in the Pacific Northwest. This week, and this week alone, they are having a clearance sale. You can go to blacklabelsupplements.com, and when you add the supplements to the cart, when you go to checkout, it should be 50% off. Again, this should be this week only so make sure to act now and give it a try and as always if you or someone you know is thinking of buying selling or refinancing a property in the pacific northwest make sure to reach out to myself connor webb the couch gm as i'm a mortgage broker full-time and it's my job to assist my clients in finding the best home financing option for their needs and it's my goal to help as many sports fans athletes and fellow coog grads to get into the home of their dreams if you'd like to reach out to connect my contact information will be in the description of this video. And with that, let's get into the episode. The Cougs get the win Saturday in Pullman against the University of Hawaii, 42 to 10. They moved to bowl eligibility in just week eight of the season. They did against the Rainbow Warriors what they should do against those types of teams. Coming off of a, a narrow win against Fresno State the prior week, John Matier went 23 of 27, 295 yards with three touchdowns in the air, a completion percentage of 85.2%, which... Someone replied to one of my posts, apparently is the fourth most efficient passing game in all of WCU football history. He also added two rushing touchdowns on eight carries, 34 yards on the ground, five touchdowns on the day. Dylan, what are your initial thoughts after this game against Hawaii? Uh, Johnny boy shut my ass up. Um, you know, obviously the Fresno State game, there was certain things that he didn't like to see on film. There was some decision making that looked like a freshman quarterback, but everything was simplified this past weekend. A great game plan from Ben Arbuckle and and company, you know, run pass option. You saw a lot of running and the Cougs just took advantage of a Hawaii team that, you know, frankly, just is not on their level from a talent standpoint, a coaching standpoint. I mean, really across the board, it's a, it's a game you had to get. Obviously, we had the Sailor Coug jerseys for homecoming. Fantastic look. I thought it was awesome. And, you know, the, the stadium was packed, too. That That's going to be a, a topic for another day as, as, as fans are going to really need to start showing out to these games. I understand that not everybody in the world wants to see Wyoming play, but this team's got an opportunity to be ranked possibly at the end of this upcoming week. So, yeah, fantastic game all around. Defense was awesome. I thought Jeff Schmetting over the last couple of weeks has been really dialing up more pressures, different looks than we've been accustomed to seeing from our defense this year. And, you know, that's going to be a big aspect for us is, hey, we're very good on the back end. If you've got Jamari Colson, Adrian Wilson, uh, Ethan O'Connor, can we start getting some more and more pressure with, you know, four to six guys up front? So it's going to be another test this week. San Diego State is is coming off of a bye. So they've had, you know, two weeks to prepare for Washington State, and it's a road game. So I'm excited to be there live. Uh, it's going to be my first time in Snapdragon Stadium here in San Diego. Um, this is not pro SDSU. This is uh, me and Connor's tournament baseball team. So don't don't fire me off in the in the mentions, please. I gave him the chance to change it to hat. He decided not to. We're just going to roll with it. And in this game against Hawaii, you know, WCU finished with 444 yards. Hawaii finished with 300. Mm -hmm. WCU had, you know, two fumble recoveries and an interception. Those played a huge role in the overall game. And moving into into the preview of San Diego State, it, they are a pretty comparable team to the University of Hawaii in that Hawaii has had the solid defense. They were rated as the top in the Mountain West so far this year. Obviously, when traveling, things are a bit different. But you look at San Diego State and their defense, here it says that San Diego State University's best player on the defensive side of the ball is their edge, Trey White. He's tied for the nation's lead with 11 sacks and stands atop the Mountain West with 15 tackles for loss. Texas transfer J.D. Coffey leads the team with 33 tackles and is one of six players with an interception. This article here from Coug fans states that you can make a pretty strong case that White is the best pass rusher that the Cougars have seen all year long. 
And when you look back at that Boise game, when the defense is able to get pressure on John Matier, that's when, you know, he shows his colors of the offensive line. And then also just the fact that this is his first year as a starter and scrambling, trying to extend plays. We'll see if he can get out of that pressure and if the offensive line can hold up. Yeah. And, and what you're trying to say is like getting uh, rid of those freshman tendencies. Right. Um, and, and some of the things that we've seen John unable to do through the first six weeks, as opposed to what we saw last week. Hey, if you don't see anybody throw the ball out of bounds, just get the ball out. It, it's more so with John of just being able to be that, you know, that dual threat with his legs, with his long arm, but also, trying to not compound mistakes and also still be a game manager um, because with the remaining schedule, we, we just need a guy that's going to go in there and not turn the ball over. I mean, at Oregon state watching them against UNLV this past weekend, I don't know if anybody saw that game, Connor, um, you know, there was a, a possible pass interference at the end in the end zone. The Beavs almost came back from a 16 point deficit, but you know, looking at that offense over at Oregon state, they can't score. They have a tough time scoring. Same with Wyoming, same with San Diego State. So a lot of these games to finish out the season are going to be, hey, we got to go in. We got to not turn the ball over. We got to manage this game and and move the chains. So I think everything that WSU wants, they obviously know it's in front of them. You know, you're six and one. You've got the most receiving votes, I believe 44 with the AP poll this past week. So that puts them at 26 in the coaches or in the AP poll. They were 28th in the coaches poll. And we'll get into this later in the show. There's a lot of teams ranked 19 through 25 that are playing better teams this weekend. So, you know, you got an opportunity to go in, get a dub at San Diego State and find yourself ranked 23 or 24 the following Monday. And Jake Ticker said after this game that they essentially narrowed the menu of the playbook offensively and what they were they were calling plays on. They were calling essentially too much for John Matera with where he's currently at in his development. They kind of took away the deep ball. They had the jet sweep pass to Kyle Williams for the touchdown. Or was that Chris Hudson? Chris Hudson. That was Chris, Chris Hudson. Uh, they had short passes and... WC is one of the leading yards after catch teams in the country. I don't have any stats on me, but it sounds like Kyle Williams, Chris Hudson, these guys, Hernandez was able to break a massive tackle and break it outside for a touchdown. They just need to keep things simple for Matir to help with his progression. Keep it simple, allow the receivers to go after the catch, and then also John Matir to scramble and to have those quarterback runs when it's deemed necessary. Well, our guy, our guy Jeff Nusser had another fantastic weekly newsletter and you know he he brought up the stats of just the percentage between run and pass at fresno state pass drop back was 48 percent of the time and a run handoff was 21 percent of the time this week against hawaii that pass drop back was at 41 percent and the run handoff was at 36 percent so 15 percent more running plays obviously we said it last week Dickert let it kind of made let it be known in that press conference. Hey, we got to get back to who we are and understanding. Hey, we run the football well here this year. I know that hasn't been the the, the norm here over the last decade with Washington State turning into, you know, air raid you with Mike Leach and and so on and so forth. But when you have guys like Way Sean Parker, Javonski, I mean, you've got a good running back room, and your quarterback can go get you 50, 60 yards in his sleep on the ground every weekend. For some reason, it really annoys me that in college we still considered a sack a, a negative rushing loss. That needs to be changed because if, if you imagine how many rushing yards Matier would have this year if you, you, you took sacks out of that. You know, it's it's going to be interesting to see. The other thing, too, is like you brought up the receivers. Carlos Fernandez with the first touchdown of the game. He looks healthy. He looks quick. He got to the outside, got to the edge, got that touchdown with ease. And then Chris Hudson is just coming into his own. I mean, I've got some stats here on the side that I'll pull up real quick. But yeah, Hudson this year. He had 10 targets last week, seven receptions, 90 yards, long of 33, that touchdown you're talking about. Kyle Williams, just a you know, manageable day at the office, four receptions, 59 yards. And then Carlos Hernandez with his best game of the season, you know, obviously eased into things last week against Fresno State, four receptions, 55 yards, and a touchdown. And then Cooper Mathers keeps finding, finding his way into the end zone, man. So it's nice to see the tight ends kind of turn it up a notch and I think that's another thing, too, that you're seeing in, you know, year three of this offense of adding this wrinkle of uh, of the tight ends. You're starting to see them used a little bit better and you're starting to see WSU understand, you know, their, their whole grand scheme. 
as well. Man, I, I wish there was another angle of that touchdown throw to Mathers that looked like a dart. It looked like there was two, you know, linebacker safety kind of lined up there and then the tight end through there. And it looked like a great throw. It was a it was a bullet, but kind of adding to what you just described, John Matier via PFF is graded as the third highest graded rushing quarterback in the country, only behind Blake Horvath from Navy and Bryson Daly from Army. I'm going to need to make a player profile on Bry Bryson Daly because I mean, his stats are wild. He's got like 18, 19 rushing touchdowns and just the style of the game that they play. Obviously, they run the ball a ton. But John Matier, he can do it on the ground. And then kind of adding to that and the, the WC rushing game overall, moving back to San Diego State's defense, University of Hawaii had 15 sacks in seven games. San Diego State has 25 sacks in six games, which is number two in the country. However, the Aztecs are only 96 nationally in run defense. So their, their rush defense is not quite the same as their pass defense and pass rush defense. So if WCU can get it started on the ground early, that could be a great start in what, the, what they need to get the upper hand. Yeah, Oregon State already played SDSU. I believe it was the first week of the season, too. They won 21-0 here down in Snapdragon. I mean, just handled the Aztecs in every aspect of that game. In terms of, of what SDSU is bringing on the offensive side of the ball, uh, first-year head coach Sean Lewis. He was brought in from Colorado. He was OCN under the whole Dion show at Colorado last season. Um, and he brings over uh, Danny O'Neill who committed to Colorado, was ready to play under Lewis. Lewis took the job and said, hey, man, I got the keys. You want to follow me to San Diego State? They're yours. And that's kind of what happened with him this year. So O'Neill's only got one interception. He is your prototypical. He's game managing. They are not asking him to do a whole lot. So in terms of what, S what WSU needs to do, stack the box, force this guy to throw the football, and make some plays in the back end, not to mention, you know, continuing this two-week success rate of getting pressure on the quarterback as well. You have to like what you've seen from the Cougs in the Fresno State game as well as last week against Hawaii. Hat off to, to Jeff Schmetting because, you know what, if I was if I was running things there, he might have been gone already. San Diego State's last five games, they beat Wyoming at Wyoming 27-24. They beat Hawaii in San Diego 27-24 as well. Then they their first three games of the year, they lost Oregon State, as you mentioned, 21-0. They lost at Cal 31-10, and then they lost at Central Michigan 22-21. Trey White, obviously the edge there. 11 sacks, 10 on his own. Two were considered, you know, um, game, ta game tackling. Sacks. Yeah, but over his last four weeks, last game against Wyoming, two sacks. Previous game against Hawaii, three sacks. Central Michigan, three sacks. At Cal, two and a half sacks. He got 10 in the last four weeks. That's ridiculous. So it's going to be interesting to see how the Cougs are going to be able to handle a staple, staple edge pressure and a guy that you know is going to get after the quarterback. And, you know, the other aspect, too, with San Diego State football, you know, obviously over the years, those – those years under Rocky Long and Brady Hoke, a lot of winning, uh, a lot of bowl games. From 2010 to 2022, San Diego State, 113 and 54 overall. They went to 12 bowls in those 13 years, with the exception being the COVID year in 2020, not getting a bowl there. Nobody did. They've been ranked four times in those in that 13-year span in 2021. They finished, I believe, 21st or 23rd in the college football playoff rankings. So this is a university. This is a school that obviously the, the Pac-12 is looking at and saying, hey, there's opportunity. There's a new stadium down here. There's only two shows in town. It's San Diego State Athletics and the Padres. San Diego State has already done a fantastic job in their basketball program at Viejas Arena in bringing in sellouts. Their Gonzaga tickets for November 18th went on sale today. A buddy of mine, shout out Sean Trees, said that they were sold out in five minutes. So it just shows to show you, if you can build a winner down here in San Diego, they're going to show up. So I think there's a lot of legs to go with the San Diego State program moving forward. And you hope Sean Lewis is that guy to get him there after this week and if you're free on saturdays make sure to check out the walk-ons adult league baseball team down there in san diego as well some prime time baseball they just won a national championship uh this game yeah, will be see me maybe get thrown out of a game <laughs> head on down the viral clip score right there this game will be saturday 7 30 at snapdragon stadium it'll be prime time game time weather will be 66 degrees right now wcu is favored by 15 points 
we didn't feel confident. And also the over under is 55 and a half. We didn't feel confident at all with the spread last week against, you know, it was like eight, 17 and a half, 18 against the Y. How do you feel about these lines right here? Unfortunately, I didn't make anybody generational wealth last week. Uh, I wasn't really feeling the 18 and a half that covered easily. I'm going to go ahead and, and take, take those 15 points. I'm not going to give them to SDSU. I'm going to take them. I'm going to run with them and final score prediction. WSU 34, San Diego State 13. Now getting into our social media posts of the week, I uh, put out a poll on my Instagram story. If you aren't already, follow the Couch GM on Instagram, Twitter. I'll be putting out questions and feel free to tag me in anything that you guys want us to talk about the upcoming week. Question number one is that if the Cougs finish the season at 11-1, is that enough for the college football playoff or is it too weak of a schedule? Ooh, man, that's a good question. I kind of took my eyes, ears, thoughts off of that after the Boise State loss. Boise State loss, I should say. They're going to have to have a lot of help. You got teams like Army and Navy who are both undefeated right now in the AAC. They still each have to play Notre Dame this season. So, you know, I think at this point, you know, if you can continue to r rattle off these big time wins over the next three or four games, yeah, maybe there's a shot, but also Oregon State losing to UNLV at home didn't help things. You were going to hope they get that win and rattle off some more up until Boise State. You know, I, I, I don't think that's where Cougs should be looking. Personally, you take a look at the way the bowl distribution is set up this year. For the next two seasons, the Pac-12 schools, even if the defectors that went to the Big 12 or the, the Big 10, it's, it's based off of record. And taking a look at records, we'll get into this into a second. You have Oregon, who's 7-0, and and the only former Pac-12 school that's ranked right now. And they're likely a shoe-in for the college football playoff. Now, the top bowl for the Pac-12 will be the Alamo Bowl. And many Cougs are very well traversed with the Alamo Bowl. 2018, Gardner Minshew, 11-2 season, finished with a top 10 ranking at the end of the year. That's going to be the top crown jewel followed by the Holiday Bowl and the Sun Bowl, and you take a look at the Cougs, they should get to 10 wins. You know, let's say they lose that road game to Oregon State. They still finish 10-2. and two. Based off of how everyone else is looking, they should have the top priority for the best remaining bowl game going forward. But to answer your, your question, Gavin and, and, and Long, I, I, I do think the strength of schedule is too weak. You had Texas Tech, who was 5-1 and one last week, lose uh, to Baylor. You have UW now losing these games to Rutgers. And yeah, so uh, some of your marquee wins are now kind of fading a bit. Army and Navy, they both play uh, Notre Dame, as you mentioned, and then they play each other at the end of the season. So one of them is going to be likely a two-loss team when it's all said and done. There is still an outside shot of them making it, but again, you know, it's going to take a lot more than just them getting to 11-1 realistically for that to happen. And then with that being said, you, you already kind of answered at the Alamo Bowl. Is that your prediction for where the Cougs would be if, if they were 11-1? That's going to be my prediction. And how great would it be if it'd be Alamo Bowl? Because you're going to get a big 12 school in that realm. What if it's De a Dion, you know, and, and the Buffs? They come in at 9-3. and three. That's going to put up some ratings for uh, for Wazoo. You just jump on the on the Dion rating bandwagon. It could be even a Utah. It could be an Iowa State. Um, we'll see. And Dylan, you pulled up the stats for how the Pac-12, the former Pac-12, has been doing so far this year. What are those stats? It's honestly <laughs> hilarious. We'll just start with overall record, 38 and 32. And we're talking Oregon, UW, USC, UCLA, Arizona, ASU, Utah, Colorado, Stanford, and Cal. In conference, 12 and 23 overall. You take away Oregon's 7-0 record, the remaining nine are combined 31 and 32, under 500. Oregon right now is the only team that is ranked out of the defecting 10. And we've seen issues all over. USC going back and forth across the country, losing to Minnesota, losing to Penn State, losing to Maryland, Maryland. You know, Utah, four and three, one and three. UCLA, two and five, one and four. Cal, three and four, oh and four in conference. It's it's brutal. And it sucks to see because the Big 12, or sorry, the Big 10 and the SEC, they knew darn well the only conference that can rival us, not the Big 12. It ain't them. It's the Pac 12. 
when you look at last year's football season, it was the best overall conference. You had UW make the national championship. You had an Oregon team that only two losses, UW. You know, you had a had a decent decent Arizona team last year. So it's it's it sucks to see. And it, you know, it just makes you go back and forth. You know, if this project Rudy comes back, hey, maybe everything's back to norm in, in 2031. And just focusing on the Huskies for a second, big shout out to uh, Dave Softy. UW very well should go five and seven this year. They likely will miss a bowl game. They are facing at Indiana this upcoming week. That is 9 a.m. Pacific time against number 13 ranked Indiana. They will then have USC at home. They will then head to number three ranked Penn State. They will then have UCLA at home, which very well might be their last win of the year. And then they're at Oregon to finish it off. So the Huskies, along with all the rest of those teams, end up leaving the conference. Things dissolve, you know, a ton of turnover on the roster, X, Y, and Z. But this is just the the state of where things are at currently. They're they're back to rebuilding, and the Cougs are in a good spot. The the Huskies not so much. Not to mention they're getting a half share this season. The Huskies are getting a half share. All right. The next social media question is: Will we be able be able to keep Johnny Johnny Football Junior? Realistically, from how I see it, I see it a lot like Cam Ward with how he did it. You know, Wazoo for two years and then transfer as a senior to the university of your choice really we'll see which texas school is going to have availability for john Matier after next year after his junior season he'll be able to pick wherever he wants to go because another year of development in this wsu offense that is going to allow him to progress as a passer as a rusher he very well should be a heisman front runner heading into next year if if any national media outlets pay attention to what's going on here but realistically i see it as two years at wsu and then he's transferring somewhere else yeah, and you know, the big thing, too, that's a great question is, hey, what can we do for him nil wise right away? Uh, you know, obviously he has that barbecue NIL commitment. He had a Coug fan NIL commitment. Northern Quest Casino, that's that's where we're starting to get into bigger lump sums of money. There's, I haven't seen anything out on what he's making, but if you go to what Drew Timmy made, the Gonzaga big, I mean, he made upwards of 500 grand. You know, it, it, it may be a total of a mill over his time because he candidly said, hey, look, I'm going to make more money staying in school via NIL than trying to go pro. So I think those are big steps. Obviously, still had the same GMC commitment that we saw recently that Cam Ward got with the truck. Johnny Matier's got that as well. You know, it's tough because, hey, if if we do go 11 and one and, and sneak into the college football playoff final playoff, or you go 10 and 2 and 11 and 1 and, and win an Alamo Bowl against a ranked opponent and finish in the top 15. Now you're like, uh, is it Johnny football and Jake football even? You know, so, you know, I, I look at, at, at a guy like Dicker. I don't think he's going to leave, but, you know, it's coach speak. These guys, you know, they, they say the right things all the time and they give themselves just a, a little bit of a an out and he was you know uh puck you know the puck drop obviously uh puck sports uh, a big time coog and, and a big time guy a former K- kjr over the airwaves and now is doing his own thing with jim moore over there you know said it he had he had dickert on on last week and dickert just slightly gave him a mouth he's like dickert said hey i only want to coach for another 10 years was it here well that's the plan that's just a little out you know a little coach speak in actuality, I think if we go 10 and 2, I think there's a chance we keep them. But I think, hey, if this is a, a a banner year at WSU, you could possibly expect to not see either John or Jake back the following year. Kind of speaking to that, at the end of this last game, you noticed that it wasn't, you know, Zebby Eckhouse that came in for those final snaps. It was Jackson Potter. And after the game, J- Dickert stated that there was some internal stuff. That's why Jackson was the one that was getting the snaps. I was curious, you know, was there some clubhouse stuff going on? But as Dylan kind of described, if you look on Twitter, it's realistically to keep Zebby's red shirt alive so that he could either play for WCU next year or he could transfer somewhere else to play. So, you know, having Zebby as a backup in case Johnny were to leave after this year and go somewhere else, or if he were to stay, then Zebby can transfer elsewhere. Yeah, and that's exactly what it is. You know, it's it's, you have that four-game minimum. Uh, of how many games you can play without burning that red shirt. You know, obviously, Zevi came here to try and win the job. And you know what? Talk about the ultimate teammate. Doesn't win the job out of camp. You're a senior. 
you know, this could be maybe one of the last spots you're going to be able to be able to play football at the highest level. You haven't heard a peep from that. You haven't heard a peep at all. The locker room is fantastic. And this is just a way where, hey, you know, Dicker and the staff, they're looking out for him. Whether he wants to play elsewhere next season, whether we lose John next year and you need Zebby. I mean, there's a lot of different ways this can go still over the final six weeks of the year. And God forbid, hey, something happens to John where you're on a four-week injury. Well, you know what? You're going to burn that red shirt and Zebby's probably going to be playing. But hats off to Jackson for coming in and, and getting some time on the field. I'm sure he probably had a good night in Pullman. But, you know, we'll we'll see. But that's just kind of the gist of, of what's going on with the whole uh, red shirt musical chairs that's going on. And then we're, we're going to do a WSU around the league or around the world uh, update. So Dylan, you had some updates first? Yeah, no, we're going to, we're going to span the globe here. We'll start off first with our NFL Cougs, Frankie Louvu, just dominating this season. First on the, on the commanders and sacks with four, he's got 43 tackles, which is second to Bobby Wagner, who's now a commander there. Shout out Hawks. One force fumble, two fumble recoveries. As I termed the nickname years ago with Coog fan, the Boa from Samoa, having a fantastic year, and he got paid. You love to see that. Jalen Watson, not so good news. He had just been elevated over the past couple weeks as the second corner starter for the Kansas City Chiefs behind former dog McDuffie. And he fractured his ankle yesterday. And I want to give a shout out to Wazoo Jobu, who kind of explained to me you know, what it means for Jalen Watson, who is in the last year of his rookie contract. He basically told me, hey, he's been grading out as one of the best players on the Chiefs this season by PFF, pro football focus. Now he misses the next 11 games. He's coming off an injury. So if he didn't get injured, you look at this from a payday standpoint for Jalen Watson. He's going to play the entire season. He's going to be highly sought after and be a free agent. Now all of that is up in the air. Um, so you hope he can make a return. And you hope the man can get paid because he deserves it. And the last uh, football update we have is Jaden Hicks, also of the Kansas City Chiefs. Great ESPN personality, Lewis Riddick. He tweeted about Jaden Hicks this year. He was all on the Jaden Hicks bandwagon since the Senior Bowl. He had his first interception one of Brock Purdy's three interceptions in San Francisco this week, and that was in the red zone. So that was a big play. I think it was 21-12 Chiefs at the time. So shout out Jaden Hicks. We're going to throw it to the couch GM for our baseball update for Cougs. Yeah, we got two former Cougs that were in the playoffs this year and one that is now in the World Series. So first off, starting off with Kyle Manzardo, designated hitter, first baseman for the Cleveland Guardians. He played for Wazoo. He played in 53 games for the Guardians in the regular season. And in the postseason, he made appearances in nine separate games. On the postseason, he is six for 19 with a 316 batting average and 842 OPS. The Guardians got balanced by the Yankees, who have Ian Hamilton on the Yankees. He is now in the World Series. However, when he was playing the Guardians in his last appearance, he went over to cover first base. He ended up straining his calf. So Ian Hamilton... Since he was taken off of the ALCS roster due to that injury, he is not going to be eligible to play in the World Series. But uh, I actually played high school baseball with him, Skyview High School. We got a local that's in the World Series. It's absolutely crazy to see what he's doing and so happy for him. And, and I mean, it's just going to be an awesome series. And hope he can bring home a ring to Vancouver, Washington. Yeah, anybody but the Dodgers, please. Anybody but the Dodgers. And we're going to finish it off and in the region with Jalen Wells, 39th overall pick by the Memphis Grizzlies this past year. Just a phenomenal story. Was a D2 All-American at Sonoma State. Came to Washington State. Didn't start at the start of the season. And he finished starting the rest of the season. Just an amazing shot against the four-point play against Arizona. And he is having himself a good little preseason. He's leading all rookies in points per game at 14.4. Averaging 23.2 minutes per game. Uh, he's 12 for 25 from deep. That's good for 48% from deep. So he's trying to challenge and, and get into a possible rotation spot. He's got some veterans like Luke Kennard and some other guys that are in front of him. But this is a, a story to watch 
over the rest of the season is how long does it take for Jalen Wells to push himself into the rotation? Because I've seen nothing but good tweets and good information coming out of Memphis Airways and Memphis uh, Twitter ways. And then you had some breaking news. Yeah, I saved this one for us. I tweeted out yesterday, Washington State played their first secret scrimmage of the season. It was at Colorado State, who was in the NCAA tournament uh, this past season. They took down Colorado State 87 to 78. And from a source, they were down the entire first half by eight points nearly the whole first half and came back and got a dub in a tough place to win. Um, So that is a big time accomplishment for David Riley and the staff. According to a source, they will have another closed secret scrimmage with Montana University next weekend or this upcoming weekend. So just some stats to, to pile off. Big Sky newcomer of the year last year was Lawan Watts. He transferred over with David Riley from Eastern Washington. He put up 20 points um, in the scrimmage, and he is a guy that Cougar fans are going to fall in love with. Lawan Watts is the real deal. He is going to be like our version of a Draymond Green with much better offense. So he's six foot six. He's a tank. He can do it all. His dad played football in the NFL little cup of coffee there. And then the bell of the ball, Cedric Coward. I was so impressed with him and Isaiah Watts at uh, the West Coast Conference Media Day that the field of 68 with Jeff Goodman um, and Rob Doster, they did a fantastic job there interviewing everybody and kind of handling the media day. A little bit of a circus over there, but I thought Cedric Coward and Isaiah Watts handled themselves fantastic. Um, you could tell that this team is gelling. They're close. They genuinely like being around each other. Cedric Coward in that close scrimmage, 13 points, uh, nine rebounds, seven assists. Um, he's a guy that has an opportunity to work himself into a first round draft pick at the end of the year. So Cougar basketball, we're two weeks from the day. It's going to start up the, the 4th of November against Portland State at home in Beasley Coliseum as the Cougs look to make another trip to the dance this March uh, with a completely new roster. So very excited to, to see basketball season starting up soon. And looking at the schedule on December 28th, the day after my birthday, the Cougs are headed to University of Portland to play them. So I'll have to go to that December 28th game and get a little behind the scenes action blog. And uh, so where they had that secret scrimmage from that podcast with Tate, is that the where the U.S. national team also practices? Yeah, so the U.S. national team ha- uses Colorado State's facilities. And like Tate was saying, I, I posted a, a, a quick 16-second soundbite of it on my Twitter is, hey, that's the end. You know, they're developing NBA players, whether it's David Roddy, uh, essential, where you're going to have legit facilities. You have USA kind of sneaking around. I mean, that's just a good uh, way to recruit um, and build a program. Nico Medved, fantastic head coach for Colorado State. That's a big time win. Now, also, Colorado State has a lot of newcomers in this year, but a lot of uh, big time transfer players coming in as well. So, this was fantastic to hear because the Cougs, they got to win some games in this non conference to really give them a puncher's shot at getting into the tournament and being on the bubble. You have a game against Iowa. You're going to have a a possible game against SMU. You're going to have two games against Gonzaga and St. Mary's. And gosh, for for the life of me, I'm missing uh, another. Oh, Boise State and UW and non-conference as well. So there's going to be some resume building games in that non-conference portion of the season. And you're going to need to see them rattle off nine or 10 wins out of those uh, 12 or 13 non-conference games before you get into the West Coast Conference uh, conference. If you. If you made it to the end, make sure to like and subscribe on this video and to the Couch GM. Follow Dylan at Dylan Howe on Twitter. And make sure to tune in, watch the San Diego State game this weekend, and be on the lookout for our update next week. And uh, I'll be down there for the San Diego State game. I'm looking forward to uh, talking to some SDSU fans and WSU fans, some some brief interviews on how we feel about the Pac-12 and being conference mates moving forward.